Welcome to Radiant Midweek. Here we go. Hey there, welcome to Radiant Midweek, and uh, if you like what you're hearing these past few weeks, take a moment to hit like or subscribe on there. That'll inform you when new podcasts are coming out. We're going to try to get you a new one every week. That may not always be possible, but uh, as we continue this series through the end times, I hope you're enjoying the materials, and don't forget to tell your friends. What is Radiant Midweek? Well, it's really just our attempt to take the conversation beyond Sunday morning and give you some things to think about and study throughout the week. Oftentimes there are subjects and other things we'd like to explore that we just don't have time on Sunday morning or it's just not the appropriate place to do it. I'm hoping Radiant Midweek allows us the ability to dive into some of the issues of our culture, maybe even learn and meet some people in our community. We're exploring all kinds of ideas on how to continue the conversation throughout the week, get outside of our walls, and live beyond Sunday morning. So welcome to Radiant Midweek. I'm so glad that you're here. This week, we're going to do an interesting study of a chapter in the book of Daniel. And what's so interesting about this chapter is within the course of about 35 verses, there's almost 130 predictions or prophecies that actually happened. They all came true. And it's fascinating. It's Many scholars call it the most prophetic chapter in the entire Bible. And the reason I want to look at this as we continue to build our foundation of why do we study prophecy? Why is it important? Can the Bible be trusted? What are even some of the things that cause us to stumble in our study of prophecy? That's the foundation we're building right now before we jump into Matthew 24 or Revelation or even dive into Daniel further. We want to just establish this foundation. So hang with us as we build our case. And I'm hoping you're learning through this that the Bible can be trusted as a source of prophecy and understanding the future. Why? Ultimately, it wants you to know that God is in control and there is hope that he has a plan, that he has not forgotten about us, and that we can step into that plan and be a part of having eternal life with him. That's the hope of studying in times. It's not to depress us. It's not to get us down, although there are some very difficult things we're going to have to cover. Uh, the Bible talks about some very dark times ahead, but it is not to depress us. It's not to get us down. Ultimately, what we have to realize is God prophesied and put these things in place to let us know that he intends to take his broken creation and make it whole. And for that reason, we have an enormous amount to celebrate, be thankful for it as we worship this amazing God. But as we dive into this really interesting chapter today, I hope that this continues to build your understanding that the Bible can be a great source for prophecy. In fact, it is our source as Christians for prophecy, and it can be trusted. Chuck Swindoll had this to say. He says, this is one of the most remarkable chapters in the entire Bible. And like I said, in just the first 30 to 35 verses, there's almost 135 prophecies that have come true. This is remarkable, and it stands as a standard for us to know that the Bible is true, that God is at work. It's a supernatural thing that we can trust and we can lean into, not only to learn and to grow, but to help us understand this God and to put our trust in him in everything we do. It's so this chapter has one of the most specifically fulfilled prophecies in the Bible, and it predicted about 375 years of history with an enormous amount of accuracy. So that's why I'm taking a break to stop. In fact, we'll see how far we even get in this podcast. My guess is this one might end up being a two-parter or even a three-parter. So be patient, but I'm hoping as you learn about these prophecies and how they came true, that you will just be as amazed as I am and more and more trust the Bible as being your source for wisdom and life and understanding that this loving God wants us to live lives of hope and he wants us to know that he's still in control. So hang tight on this ride as we walk through a lot of details. You'll probably see me looking over at my monitor a little more than usual because there's a lot of details and I want to make sure we get them right. Again, Alexander was shown the book of Daniel, 
And he understood that he was the person that Daniel was talking about, particularly in this chapter as we reveal Alexander. And the point of that being, it could not have been written in the first century BC when a lot of scholars think so, if Alexander had seen it two to 300 years before that. It was written before even Alexander. Therefore, we understand that this is prophecy and this is true. And so as we begin to study chapter 11, we first need to look at Daniel chapter 10, a couple verses there to understand when did this occur and what is the purpose of this? What is the angel letting Daniel know ahead of time? So as we go to Daniel chapter 10, we see in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. Now, what we know is this was about 535, 534 B.C. That was the third year of Cyrus. So it's written in the 6th century B.C. And uh, another thing that scholars understand that this is probably getting really close to Daniel's death. He's near the end of his life. We have a wise man with a great deal of experience being shown a vision of what the future looks like. And I think that for that reason, we should be paying attention. Let's dive down then into verse 14. And what does that angel have to tell him? Why are we doing this? And he says, well, I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. So right here, the angel goes ahead and puts him on notice. This vision is off in the distant future. God wants you to know this. Write it down, Daniel. Daniel 11, 1 says, now I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. And when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Scholars are immediately uh, forced to ask some important questions here. Is that uh, three or four kings from the current king that Daniel is serving under, or are these three to four future kings? By and large, the evidence seems to indicate this is three to four future kings, because we know who this fourth wealthier king is clearly from history and from the Bible, as we'll discover here in just a couple moments. Uh, But also, it seems to skip one more king that fell in that lineup, and that's a guy named King Smerdis of Persia. He only ruled for less than one year, around 522 BC, uh, and he was considered an imposter to, to the throne. So the angel seems to ignore this king altogether. And so the idea is that there will be three more kings after the current ruler of Persia, and then a fourth will arise who is wealthier and more powerful than all the others. And we know from history who that person is, and you might have heard of him as well. His name is King Xerxes of Persia, and uh, he married a famous woman in the Bible. For those who know the story, her name was Esther. And uh, anyone familiar with the story, we don't have time to cover the entire thing today, but uh, a man named Haman, who was an advisor to the king, tried to trick the king and the queen by having them sign an edict to exterminate the Jews throughout the kingdom. It was only through the supernatural act of God and the bravery of Esther to approach her husband unannounced and to lovingly explain to him the situation that the Jews were saved from this terrible persecution that was awaiting them. And uh, Haman, as a result, and what you may know from the story, ended up losing his life. It's an amazing story, and I encourage you to go read it. We don't have time to cover that today. But another reason we know this King Xerxes, some of you may know that great movie from 2006 called 300. And the king in that movie, his name was Xerxes, and maybe you recognize him from the picture right there. And this is where the verse talks about that. It says in there, remember, he would stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. What we know from history and what you know from the story from uh, the movie is that he indeed did want to expand his empire. He kind of coveted Greece, wanting to grow further west with the empire, but he was stopped in his tracks and uh, attacked by the Spartans and by the Athenians as well. Um, Of course, at that time, um, it was kind of a draw and everyone went back, but the Greeks never forgot this. Uh, They were angry about it. There were skirmishes that happened for the next hundred years. They were constantly at odds with each other, but it started there. And as a result, about a hundred years later, a young man would arise who had a great memory of how they were attacked by the Persian people. 
and that would lead him to take on the Persian Empire and eventually would conquer them. And once again, we bring that man back in the story, and his name is Alexander. And that's where we pick up the story in Daniel 11.3, and it says, Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. This is Alexander the Great from history, and that is a great description of him. He seemed to go unopposed. He accomplished the the unaccomplishable. I mean, it was amazing what he did, uh, conquering an empire and many others as well, oftentimes that were much larger than his army, uh, but he didn't seem like he could be stopped. Uh, His empire would eventually be stretched from Greece all the way down to Egypt and Ethiopia and as far as India. It was only when his soldiers kind of rebelled against him and his captains and said, we're not going any further, that he was forced to turn around and head back and manage his kingdom. But uh, one of the first countries Alexander went after in revenge was, of course, um, Persian Empire. And what's interesting is in one of his initial battles, He went up against them with uh, 35,000 men. And at that time, King Darius had over 100,000 men. And the Greeks would end up killing about 20,000 Persian Persian soldiers. And Alexander would only lose 100 Greek soldiers in that battle. It was an amazing thing. There would end up being a couple more battles in the next two to three years before they would fully conquer the Persian Empire. But after that first battle, it seemed... uh, to be evident that Alexander was a force to be reckoned with. In fact, by 32, 33 years of age, it said that Alexander had conquered the known world. And and uh, it it is said, for instance, we talked about when those uh, generals and those captains forced him to turn around and go no further, uh, that Alexander wept. And a famous quote uh, comes in that many may have heard of. It was by Plutarch, but you may have also run into this uh, great quote from the movie Die Hard, where Hans Gruber quoted it, and he said, when Alexander saw the breadth, uh, the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. And it wouldn't be too long after that that Alexander actually would die. Uh, he was partying in the city of Babylon, drank too much, but there's also rumors that uh, he may have been poisoned. But uh, Alexander died at a young age in his 30s uh, and yet accomplished one of the greatest and largest empires ever known to the history of mankind. So we dive into verse 4 then. It says, After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. And it will go to his descendant, or it will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. And it's interesting, there's a lot packed into this verse, and we do know that after Alexander's death, the the kingdom did not ultimately go to his descendants. They tried it first. He did have three possible heirs. By the way, he had a half-brother named Philip, who at best we would say was mentally deficient, a special needs child. Uh, Another one is a son that was born after uh, Alexander had died, and then there is an illegitimate son named Hercules, So Alexander did have some heirs that they could have put as king of his empire afterwards. But the key hint to this verse to help us know that it is talking about Alexander and to prove that history is true is in that those two words, the four winds of heaven. Because what happened is a power struggle ensued after uh, Alexander died and four of his generals would end up splitting up his empire into four pieces, and each of them would rule over one of those individual pieces. There would be Ptolemy in Egypt, then Antigonus in the whole of Asia, Cassander in Europe, which is kind of Macedonia and Thessaly, and uh, boy, I'm going to get this one right, Lysimatius in Thrace, which we understand is Turkey. And so it's interesting how one line of prophecy, though, And this is what we have to be aware when we're studying prophecy. We read one line and we think, oh, things just happened very quickly in succession to each other. But just in that one line of talking about how it would ultimately be divided up into four kingdoms is more than 30 years of history. It didn't happen right away. They did try to put his sons 
uh, in power, and they were ultimately killed uh, by some of the generals and then some of the wars that ensued afterwards. But it took about 30 years after Alexander's death before the empire would ultimately be divided into four kingdoms exactly as was, was prophesied to Daniel and written down in this 11th chapter. After that, the prophecy begins to focus on these four countries, these four regions. In particular, though, this prophecy you will see as we go through uh, focuses on two of those kingdoms because they would be enormously impactful into the lives of the Jewish people and the country of Israel. And that's one of the things we have to remember is the Bible. And when we talk about prophecy, we talk about end times and what we can learn is highly centered on Israel and Jerusalem and what is going to happen to them, what has happened to them, what can we learn from that, and how does history repeat itself? Israel would find itself sandwiched between the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south, and it would be the battleground between these two countries as they fought against each other. And at times, one country would, would occupy this area of Palestine, and at other times, another country would occupy it, and poor Israel would just find themselves as a really bad sandwich at battle uh, with these two different countries for more than 130 years. And Daniel's going to talk about what that time looks like and why it's so impactful and important for us to understand as well. So let's get started. In verse uh, 5, it says, The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. So this king of the south that's becoming strong is a man we know as Ptolemy I of Egypt. And he took over Egypt pretty soon after Alexander's death. And the Ptolemies would end up remaining in control right up to another famous person that we would understand later on. And we're going to talk about here in a bit. Who, and that person we know from the movies and from the history books is Cleopatra. Uh, but the Ptolemies dom dominated this region for the next several hundred years. He had a prince named Seleucus. Now, this prince rose and took control and dominion over an area that today we would know as Syria and Iran and Iraq, that area of the Middle East that is in the news quite a bit. And for a while, he would become even more powerful than his Egyptian ruler. And in 312, Seleucus won and established this great empire that we know and understand from history is now the Seleucid Empire, named after him. But it's during this time that Ptolemy would attack and occupy Palestine, which is where Israel is. Um, but Seleucus and the Seleucid Empire would never let him live it down. They constantly claimed that that was their land, that, that the Ptolemies had taken that from them unfairly. And that's why this, this little sliver of land we call Israel would be the site of many battles, and it would just be the battleground for an argument between these two countries as they vied for who is in control of it. So what we see in the end is that there's these two powerful countries, the kingdom of the north, the Seleucid Empire, the kingdom of the south, the Ptolemies, and these two countries would fight for a long time. Now in verse 6, what we see is it says, after some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported us. So what we see from history is here that the daughter of the king of the south would be sent to the king of the north kind of as a peace treaty, as a peace agreement to unite the two countries together and take away some of the problems that they have been fighting about for some time. And this happened around 250 B.C. The woman is called uh, Berenice, and she's the daughter of Ptolemy II, who, of course, succeeded Ptolemy I. Antiochus II then uh, had divorced his wife Laodice to marry Berenice, and there was indeed peace for some time, but this peace we would find from history would not last. In fact, when Ptolemy II died, that peace treaty began to dissolve very quickly, and that's why it says that shall not remain or retain the power once Ptolemy II died, Antiochus put Berenice away, and he went back to his former wife, Laodice. Now, Laodice ended up being an interesting woman in history. She didn't trust her husband, uh, Antiochus II, 
And um, probably after divorcing her and ignoring her for a while, that might explain it. So she would ultimately have Antiochus II poisoned, but she didn't stop there. Then she would go after his children, and uh, their infant son in the previous marriage with Berenice, she, she would have that child killed, and after, and then it was during this reign of terror that her she would set her son Seleucus II on the throne for Syrian domination. So you can see this whole thing is like one really bad soap opera, and uh, truth is stranger than fiction, and it's just amazing to see how it's playing out in history and why this is so important. Let's dive now into uh, verse 7, if we could. And it says, well, one from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress, and he will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone, and then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but would then retreat to his own country. So then the angels tell him, okay, so there is a root of Berenice's uh, lineage that will come to the south and defeat uh, the kings of the north. Now, this was fulfilled in the person of Ptolemy III, who was the brother of Berenice, the branch of her roots. And it was done in revenge for the whole situation that happened previously. And, and as a result, Ptolemy III would invade Syria, he would defeat them, and he would humble Seleucus uh, II for all of the nefarious things that that empire had been up to, betraying his sister and uh, marrying the other person. And so it was revenge for that. In verse 10, we see his sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortresses. So after the defeat, the sons of the king of the north would continue the battle. So this feud continues. They can't all seem to get along. So Seleucus III now, around 227 BC, uh, begins to uh, attack the kingdom of the south. He wouldn't live very long. And the next person that would come to power would be Antiochus III. He would be known as Antiochus the Great, and he would rule for a great number of years, from 223 to 187 BC. And so they would conquer the Holy Land, particularly uh, Antiochus III, and that's part of the reason why he's been called Anti uh, Antiochus the Great. Both were successful generals, as the verse indicates here, but Seleucus III only ruled for a short time. It was Antiochus uh, the third, who took back the Holy Land and the dominion from the Ptolemies. And so as we keep reading then in verse 11, it says, Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the kingdom of the north, who also will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. And when the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. Now this was fulfilled when Antiochus the third. Uh, was defeated later on at a battle called Raphia, and uh, it had indeed happened. And once again, we have the, the kings of the south taking back the land that they claimed was their own. And um, once again, in this case, took back over the Holy Land. So you can see Israel's just going back and forth, game on, game off, game on. Uh, between these two countries, they just, they find themselves just being battered uh, in the middle of this great argument that is happening. In verse 13, it says, For the king of the north then will muster another army. Here we go. Uh, larger than the first, and after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. And in those times, many will rise against the king of the south, those who are violent among your own people. So he's talking to the Israelites and the Jews here, because that's who Daniel's people are. So even those among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. And then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. So this king, Antiochus III, who had taken Israel and then the Ptolemies come up, they took Israel back. He now would muster another army, and he's back again, and once again, this time with a fury, and he would get his revenge. And uh, by sieging and attacking Egypt directly, he would go into the land of Egypt 
Um, this would give the king of the north a dominant position in the in the glorious land, which we know is Israel. Um, and the Jewish people at first, when this happened, really liked Antiochus III. They were glad it happens. It would seem that the Ptolemies were an oppressive group of people. They did not like them. They didn't like the way they ruled. They didn't think they were prospering under them. So at first, Antiochus III was welcomed as this new king uh, in the in the Israelite kingdom, but that would not last forever. Uh, in fact, it would say that uh, their decision to support Antiochus III would ultimately be unwise uh, when he would turn on the people and would end up oppressing them as well later on. Uh, then in it, this case, Antiochus invaded Egypt once again. It talks about the Jews, those who are violent amongst their people. And because they were supportive of Antiochus at first, many of the Jews, who we would call violent, the soldiers, joined them in that battle. And that's one of the reasons that Antiochus III was able to overwhelm uh, the empire of the south, is that they had the help of the Jews during this time. Um, and all of this, again, was payback uh, because the Jewish people resented the Ptolemies and the rule for that. So let's continue in Daniel 17. It says that he will continue to come with the might of his entire army, and he will make an alliance with the king of the south, and we, he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed or help him. So here again, we have another arranged marriage where they're trying to utilize this marriage arrangement as a way of building peace amongst these two countries. But we'll see this go around. It will fail even worse than the first time. Um, the king of the north uh, tried to dominate over the king of the south. Um, and through this marriage arrangement, uh, he would hope to even just conquer Egypt. Now, who was this famous daughter that he sent. Well, we would know this name, and we'll hear from history, it's Cleopatra. However, I'm going to go ahead and say this is not the same Cleopatra that Mark Anthony uh, would be in trouble with and Julius Caesar later on. Uh, however, this is an ancestor of that Cleopatra. That whole situation with the Romans would happen about a hundred years after this occurred, uh, but you probably recognize the name. To the disappointment, however, of Antiochus III, the plan to put his daughter Cleopatra there and to stir up trouble, if not even make it possible for Antiochus to take over Egypt, uh, didn't occur. And for a simple reason, Cleopatra was not faithful to her husband. She was an adulteress and she was caught. Um, and so as a result, um, his plan, the king of the north, to take over Egypt, it didn't happen. Let's continue reading in verse 18. It says, Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands, and he will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. And after this, he will turn back towards the fortresses of his own country, but he will stumble and fall. So after this plot with his daughter Cleopatra failed, he went on the attack again. But this time he made a fatal error. He began to eyeball parts of Greece and islands in the Mediterranean that were now in control of another country that was beginning to rise up in that region. And we would hear many times throughout scripture as well. And that country was Rome. Now, what's interesting is Antiochus III would use the help of another famous general at the time who was at war with the Roman Empire. And maybe you've heard of this general. His name is Hannibal, and he was from a country called Carthage. Now, he had been defeated in a few battles, so he was kind of on the run as a bad guy in the Mediterranean area, and Rome was on the lookout for him. They were chasing him down, and they intended to do something about him. Uh, and so as he was running and looking for ways to once again attack the Roman Empire, he decided to partner with Antiochus III to take back some important seaports and areas that the Romans laid claim to. This didn't go well. Uh, the Roman general Lucius Cornelius Scipio, who had defeated uh, Hannibal in a few other battles up to that point, would eventually now defeat Antiochus in Greece. And it was a humiliating, uh, just truly disheartening uh, defeat for Antiochus III. And he would kind of return back to his own country from there with the tail between his legs. Uh, and it, it, he was defeated. He was embarrassed by this 
whole thing. In fact, it was after this that Rome told him he had to pay reparations for the battle, and he was now a vassal state of the Roman Empire. They even took one of his sons, who we'll discuss here in just a little bit, uh, prisoner, and took him to Rome. So this was, as you can imagine, it was truly humiliating for a person whose name is Antiochus the Great. Uh, needing money badly for his treasury, uh, he resorted to pillaging many of the villages on his way back. He even tried to pillage a Babylonian temple, and it's here that in retaliation the local people rose up and they killed him for it. So not too long after this defeat with Rome, Antiochus III came to his end. Let's keep going in verse 20. His successor, or his successor, will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. And once again, history nails it and tells us this is exactly what happened. It was uh, fulfilled through the reign of a man named Seleucus III, and he was the eldest son of Antiochus III. And Seleucus, because of the reparations now that he needed to pay Rome uh, in punishment for the war that they had with him, taxed the people of the Seleucid Empire in an incredible way, trying to raise that. Um, he then set his sights on Jerusalem and the temple there, but he had an angelic warning uh, not to do that. And not too long after that, because of all his taxation and because of his oppressive behavior, he was assassinated by the brother of Antiochus IV. And it's this character that we need to pay close attention to. And for that reason, I'm going to probably say that gets us to the end of this podcast because this next person that we're going to investigate, Antiochus IV, is someone who not only oppressed the, the Jews in a way beyond imagination, but he would be referenced by Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24 because of what he did with the temple. And, uh, and so I want to take a, another podcast, I think, from here to really focus in on this person because what we'll learn is uh, history does repeat itself, and he is a front runner, uh, a, a symbol of another person who is to come later on, who we will, discuss, we will discuss not only through Matthew 24, but also through the book of Revelation. Paul would talk about this individual later. So he was a foreshadow of another person who would come later on, and he would be referenced. Pay attention to what this man did. Pay attention to what was accomplished during his reign, because something even worse is coming later on. Now, through all of this, I just want to say, remember, we study this for hope. This is not to get us down, but it's pretty amazing, don't you think, that so many of these prophecies were predicted two, 300, even 400 years ahead of time. The Bible can be trusted. It is a reliable source for prophecy, and that's why I want you to lean into it. I know that people out there have made a caricature and a joke of end times prophecy. I know that there's been bozos and clowns that claim things that they should not claim. There's been predictions made. We've talked about this already, but more and more, I'm trying to build the case that when we remove some of that stuff and we get down to what the Bible actually says and we can compare it to history, it is indeed a genuine source for prophecy. God's word can be trusted. And for that reason, let's pay attention to what it has to say about the future because God wanted us to know, Jesus wanted us to know ahead of time, here's what's coming and I want you to be prepared. So hang tight as we dive in a little further. We're going to look at this next man named Antiochus IV. Some people call him the Antichrist. We'll discover why. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.